Time for Fans Forum. You got question, we got answers. Uh, you got opinions, we want to know what they are. We're going to try to run through as many as we can. John, go ahead. Okay. Pick one of your followers. All right. Let's kind of pick some of these folks at random. This is Justin C. He says, Padres, who started it with the swag chain, had to get rid of it last year to focus on actually making the postseason. <laughs> Maybe we should do the same this year with a sombrero. Just saying. Nah. I, I The guys are having fun. They really like each other. And as long as they're winning, I mean, they're not going to do it if they're in the middle of an eight-game losing streak. You know, the swag chain kind of disappeared for a little bit last season. But I like I like this sombrero for sluggers. I just think that's cool. And that's got a regionality impact, too, because it involves San Diego. It involves our friends across the border in Mexico. And, you know, you combine all that with the uh, – Rainbow Sherbert uh, City Current uniforms that they wear on yeah. Friday nights. That's pretty cool. And I, I didn't like those uniforms when they started. They kind of look like softball jerseys to me. That's kind of kind of grabbed me. I I kind of like one of those. I know I like the City Connect outfits. I mean, they 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 at first it was shocker, right? You know, but the more you learn about it, the you understand the sort of that cross cultural, you know, bi national kind of a strategy. It makes sense and it fits. Uh, so I think it's real special. You're a liar. You uh, like no, Rainbow Sherbet more no, than anybody else. No, but so. it's, it is a goofy look. I agree <laughs> with you. But when you kind of get it and then you see the fans love the the City Connect and, you know, especially like it, the, the women love a lot of it because there's a lot of really nice, you know, types of apparel they've made for the ladies. So it's it's great. I think it's a terrific uh, setup. But, but the Milwaukee Brewers do look like softball jerseys. We, all, yeah. all blue. Yeah, them and then the old White Sox when they wore the shorts, yep. you know, back in the 70s. So, yeah, some of the – but, you know, the, the Brewers have, I think, the best logo in all of baseball. Mm -hmm. And that's a good one. On we go. Sombrero slugger stays. So say the co-host. Well, I'll just throw this back one in here for Justin C. He says, honestly, sick to my stomach with all these dugout celebrations. But let's get someone else involved here. SG Sports Talk Channel, he says, San, San Jose Sharks are going to get the number one pick in this draft. That's what he's got on record. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. What are you going to say after the Ducks get the number one pick? We'll see. Uh, San Jose had a good run with an awful lot of really good, great veteran players. And those guys have now retired along the way, and they're in the midst of their rebuild, too. Okay. And then uh, let's let's uh, move on. I want to get in some of these YouTube commenters because there's some really good ones. I mean, the social media responses over the weekend, Lee, were oh. just... They were just unbelievable, especially to a lot of those video shorts that, that we were doing. So um, here's a comment from B Nasty talking about the Aztecs and the NIL and says, NCAA should have dealt with this 20 years ago. Then the athlete was at the mercy of the system while everyone else got paid for their performance but them. Now it ain't no fun because they can cut and run. Free enterprise is good for everyone. This is the parting gift from Mark Emmert, the director of the NCAA. And I have not met a person in college athletics, and I talk to people in the Pac-12, plus obviously the people here at San Diego State. I've not met anybody to think this has been handled correctly. Not that the players don't deserve additional compensation, cost of living stipend, or fees, but not everybody can afford the kind of money that's being spent in a few other places. If Texas A&M and Alabama and Georgia are paying players phenomenal amounts of NIL money because they're big cigar boosters can do it. I mean, how does that protect the health of the Aztecs, Wyoming, money troubled San Jose state, mm -hmm. um, the one double a schools at Montana, Montana state, et cetera. It's impossible to keep players because now what's creeping in, is everybody's tampering with other guys' players. They're cherry-picking players. You know, San Diego State lost a very good offensive tackle, Josh Simmons, young guy, and they played him as a freshman, and he started every minute as a sophomore. And he learned, and he had great NFL size, and they were going to teach him. And Ohio State shows up all of a sudden, and now he's a, now he's a Buckeye. Wow. And that's happening all over the country that big-time schools – or looking to the mid-major conferences, the Mid-American Conference, the Mountain West Conference, Conference USA, I like that player. We'll make a contact. Mm -hmm. He goes in the transfer portal. Next thing you know, top lineman from Appalachian State has gone to Georgia. Yeah. So I don't think that's good. I don't think it's good for the sport because, and this is a terrible thing to say, 
It's like some of these kids have become soldiers of fortune. Well, you know, they're getting an opportunity to make some money and I, I can't shame them for that. You know, just like, a, you know, like a play by play broadcaster that's working, you know, in, in a smaller section of the country gets a chance to come to San Diego, you know, so it's a good thing. But yeah, I, I read an article that was from a professor at Washington State and they're struggling with this whole NIL concept, you know, mainly because the academic people don't like all this money going on with the athletics. And one of the professors said that she would feel uncomfortable if she was, you know, teaching a student who was making $800,000 a year, you know, just, you know, blowing her out of the water in terms of, of compensation. So it's just, it has a lot of angles to these stories. Overall, I'm happy for the players. Well, the big issue is Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA, walked away from all this. He walked away by saying, we're not going to try to control NIL. Well, now you've got the big boosters at College Station, Texas, writing huge checks because they're oil magnets and they can afford it. And they'll go cherry pick anybody they want and put them in an Aggie's uniform. And it's a big problem for the lesser lights like Washington State, like mm -hmm. Oregon State, that I don't think have big NIL checking accounts to be okay. able to retain their players. I think it's a monstrous problem. Now you got the transfer portal. There's 2,060 basketball players in the transfer portal and they're all walking around hands out. Yeah. I just don't think it's good for the sport. Well, think it? about all the money that is around San Jose state. You talk about them as kind of downtrodden with money and they're right in Silicon Valley. But that doesn't mean anything if you haven't won and your alumni mm -hmm. are not supporting you. You yeah. can be in the Silicon Valley, but it doesn't mean anything if their football has been down forever. Basketball has been deplorable and it's a tough call. Tough call. Okay, next question. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, and this is, oh my God, the 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 comments about Coach Prime were just blowing up Instagram. This is from CavDB22. He said, he put everyone on notice day one. Perhaps the kids that left did not have the talent he was looking for. I don't see you crying about players at Alabama who hit the portal. Not many did. And a lot of quality players uh, in a lot of quality programs. But to hit the eject button, the number, by the way, is now 72. Really? 72 in the transfer portal at Colorado. Holy moly. That's Port almost the whole team. <laughs> yeah. Portal closed on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, he, it's as if he painted a picture that everybody who wore gold and black and played at Folsom Field last year was a bum. And I don't think that's that's probably very truthful. And I don't think that's fair. Um, uh, is it, it's the way of life now because of the transfer portal and because of the NIL and I'll throw an addendum thing that I was told via email from one of my network people that I'm with in the PAC 12. There's a lot of really upset coaches about what Deion Sanders did. And I'll tell you, they're going to have to play these teams in the PAC 12 next year in the conference. And there may be some teams that will run up scores on coach prime time because of what he did to 72 athletes at CU. These kids came to play, came to get an education and they were all told you're leaving. I'm bringing my own quote baggage. Mm -hmm. So, and baggage might be the key term here. There's a, I think there are a lot more people than have let on that are really upset. Uh, and there was an unnamed, I want to say athletic director in the Southeastern conference that was looking at the storyline in Colorado and made the comment, this was not what the transfer portal was supposed to be about. Just running everybody off. So mm -hmm. uh, I I tend to think it's a bit unethical. You disagree with me, but I saw you rip the page uh, <laughs> out of your dictionary that had the word unethical. Well, they, were, they won one game. I mean, so do you think these Pac-12 coaches, these SEC coaches are going to pick up any of those 72 players that Dion put into the transfer portal? There's no way. I mean, they just don't have the talent. It's it's not, you know, it's just the reality of what a competitive sport is all about. So, you know, you get into these these games, these teams are going to run up the score anyways, you know, to try to kind of get their rate their rankings up higher. I'm rooting for Dion. I I love everything about him, you know, and he is brash, he's bold, and I like that. You know, I told you earlier, I like the entertainment angle to sports, and I think this is exciting. So, you know, unethical, 
No, he fulfilled the contract. There's a one year <laughs> deal on a scholarship. It's not a four year commitment. Oh, this is the guy that liked the swag chain lecturing me on what's right, what's wrong in yeah. athletics. Okay, well, let's take a couple more <laughs> questions here. Go ahead, John. All right. Okay, let's get another comment here. This is also from social media on Instagram from uh, John Rizemba Photography. And he says, and he's talking about the Raiders. It's not just Gruden. Al Davis went into a Howard Hughes mode for a long time. He spent most of those years looking to abandon a fan base that displayed loyalty that he didn't deserve. Now they're nothing more than a marketing gimmick. Uh, Al Davis, early era Al Davis was all about football. X's O's, player acquisitions, reaching for guys, whether they were good people, bad citizens, whatever, who could play the game. Well, the NFL changed. It became big business, big business off the field. Al Davis was behind the power curve, rotten stadium situation, never, never could really market. And at the same time, everybody realized there are lots of places to go find players, and everybody started to scout mm -hmm. the historically black university and colleges and finding talent, and everybody started to scout the Colgate universities of the world where my friend, Mark Egan, Van Egan played. Oh yeah. Finding guys at those places. Mm -hmm. Al Davis no longer had a corner on that market and didn't have a corner on the business aspect of football. So the game really passed him by. And then he just made mistake after mistake after mistake as it relates to coaches, as it relates to draft picks, his hands-on interference with everything. And then he died and his son was given the franchises and, Mark Davis has always been attracted by the shiny little object out there. Here comes John Gruden. You go back and look, because I talked about this. 11 of the last 15 first-round picks of the Raiders have washed out. That's a pretty horrific record, and a ton of them were really bad people. Yeah. I mean, this Henry Rugg drunk-driving manslaughter story, Damon Arnett with the guns and the threats on social media. These are guys you're supposed to scope out and assess good players. Are they good citizens? What kind of people are they? And the Raiders failed miserably at that. And you can't screw up, John, that many number one picks without waking up one morning with a bad franchise. And that's a, that's where the Raiders are right now. Well, remember, the Raiders used to intentionally go for those players that were bad citizens, mm -hmm. you know, because it added to their tough guy image and and uh, they thought they were all badass and everything. But I, I just think this comment from the Instagram follower is interesting because he did. Ha Al Davis was a little like Howard Hughes. I mean, he was like yeah. this eccentric guy. You didn't see him very much during the latter part of his ownership. Um, but, you know, in every case, it always comes down to the, the top dog. It's the leadership of the organization of the franchise. And if you've got a bad owner, your team is not going to do well. And we see that with the Raiders. We've been seeing that with the Chargers. We see it with a lot of other teams. Yeah. The Raiders are not what they used to be. And I'm sorry, John is not allowed to run to his back closet and find that dented old dusty <laughs> Super Bowl trophy and run around the room with it. And say, look what we won. That was a different era, different time. Those look, art floors. <laughs> look, look, look at what you have not run. Or recently. Let's take one more here before we wrap up our bonus coverage. All right. We, then this is the other comment that was blowing up over the weekend about Trevor Bauer signing in Japan. And this is from Nahoko Lem Lemius. And she says, wow. So it's unethical to dismiss players who do not perform to the level that's expected and make the team better. But it's ethical to dismiss a coach who fails to do his job and make the team better. Sounds like a double standard. It's the nature of the beast. Is this the first time football players have been cut from a team? You know, co oh, this is a Coach Prime comment. We got it backwards there a bit. But let me just go back to, I, I screwed up this slide. Go ahead. Okay, but when it, let's talk about Trevor Bauer because a lot of people um, were, especially there were some Japanese folks that responded on the YouTube channel saying, we love him. He didn't break the law. And as long as he doesn't break the law, then it's fine. We, we should have him, you know, and, and I think I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if there is a double standard for Trevor Bauer that it doesn't necessarily apply to others. I mean, what do you think? Well, the fact of the matter that he never got charged, but he was involved in obviously some really ugly sexual misconduct activity as it relates to forced sex, sexual abuse, et cetera. Where do you draw the line? That, I guess that becomes a big issue. Now, this, this case is still on the docket. This lawsuit by this woman is going to go forward, and she's going to ask for some type of damages. But we you draw the line, I mean, Trevor Bauer's a really rock-solid pitcher. He's a smart dude, but he's a little bit arrogant. And where do you draw the line between 
being a good person or just doing what the hell you want and hope you don't get arrested. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what about Matt Ariza? Is that a double standard? Because we were saying Matt Ariza did not get in trouble with the law and he deserves a shot to play in the NFL. I mean, we both agreed to that. Um, so why does that apply to Trevor Bauer? So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to maybe second guess my own opinion originally because I think we were all shocked by Trevor Bauer and all the allegations. But part of the problem is, is that Trevor Bauer has a history of just being a jerk off, you know, so of always doing stupid things. So it was easy to pile on. But maybe, maybe if, if this woman's story is fabricated, you know, maybe was he treated unfairly? I don't know. It's it's an open question. The only time we'll tell, I think, once we, we follow this thing, once it winds up actually in court, in front of a judge, in front of a jury, uh, et cetera. Uh, very, very complicated thing. But you have to have, I'm sorry, John, you have to have standards. And if you cross that line with standards, mm -hmm. sexual misconduct to the degree that Trevor Bauer was involved, to me, is kind of crossing the line. Mm -hmm. Matt Ariza, stupid young college decision. I did stupid things. You did stupid things. Mm -hmm. We probably didn't do those, those type of stupid things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's probably a penalty that has to be paid there. I'm still hopeful Ariza will get a kick at the can to kick the football for somebody in an NFL training camp going forward. That case, that lawsuit is, is scheduled to show up on the court dockets, I believe, in October. Hey, listen, hope you've enjoyed our bonus coverage. Whether you agree with me, you should, or agree with him out in left field, that's okay, too. <laughs> we invite you to tell all your friends about what we're doing regular Thursday podcast, bonus podcasts on Monday. Alert them to subscribe. Don't be afraid to give us thumbs up. We have no pride. We'll take a five-star rating uh, if you feel like doing that on Apple. And John, look forward to yapping at you on Thursday, and let's just see what happens with the NBA playoff game, mm -hmm. the Padres road trip, and the NHL draft lottery. I want to see the Warriors even up the series tonight and make a 2-2. Push this sucker to game seven. Mm -hmm. That'd be fun to watch. Hey,